works remotely on iPad, I guess. So it's almost the same like writing on the board. You can follow easily. And also in her case, you're welcome to ask questions and interrupt and maybe I will try to look at the audience. If you raise your hand, hopefully I can, I can see you. Otherwise, just make yourself noticeable. So Yael is a professor at the Technicon, Technion in uh, Haifa in Israel. And uh, she's also a very versatile physicist working on different aspects of physics beyond the standard model. And specifically for these lectures, she will talk about a very exciting recent development. It's called New Tools in BSM Physics or at the BSM Frontier. And uh, she will specifically talk about ideas how to uh, calculate scattering amplitudes in the standard model, but also beyond. So, Yael, I hope you can hear us. And uh, yes. please go ahead with your lectures. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I really wish I could be there, uh, but I'm not, so um, I'll have to come another time. Uh, but I really, what I really want to do is to try to do this as similar as possible to a regular Blackboard lecture. And as Matthias said, if you have any questions, please don't, um, don't be shy. It, it may be just, you know, a little bit more complicated than... Um, uh, compared to a regular lecture, but please uh, stop me with uh, questions. So I'm going to talk about uh, amplitudes, and let me start with uh, a little bit of, uh, of an overview. So this uh, topic goes under uh, several different names. You can hear about uh, amplitudes. You can hear about uh, on-shell methods. Um, and it's it's become a very, very broad uh, topic, uh, really very broad. Uh, so we're just going to be able to scratch the surface. And what I'll try to do is um, I'll try to give you enough tools such that, uh, and, and also to give you a taste of some developments related to BSM physics, such that if you want to uh, really catch up and, and follow any of the uh, directions, any of the different directions in this field, um, you can uh, hopefully do that by the end of the lectures. So uh, what is this uh, about? This is really about uh, the study of scattering amplitudes. And there are many things that are covered by this. Uh, there is the study of the properties of the amplitudes, the structure of the amplitudes, methods for calculating them. And this can be either for the purpose of calculating the amplitude itself or as a way of learning something about the theory. So discovering new structures or new symmetries by looking at uh, the amplitudes in a given theory. So you can ask about, you know, why amplitudes? Uh, what's the motivation for looking specifically at amplitudes? And I think, you know, one, one way to think about this is to know that uh, in some sense, if you think about this, almost all the physical observables around us, almost all the physical things we measure are somehow related to scattering. So uh, I don't know if it's all, but almost all uh, physical processes or physical observables are related to one of two things. One is scattering, a scattering process, and the other one is a decay. So you can have, of course, uh, particle decays. You can have in non-relativistic quantum mechanics um, transitions between states. And in other cases, you have uh, some uh, particle scattering that's describing your observable. And if you think about this, this goes way back to when you started to uh, uh, study physics. You probably had a lab where you had some funny shaped table and you took some ball and you uh, rolled it on the table and scattered it of the potential essentially in uh, try to say something from the particles, from the ball's trajectory about the structure of the potential. 
if you think about uh, Coulomb scattering or the Coulomb potential, then again, it's related. I can think of this as a scattering where you have two charges, Q1 and Q2, and they exchange lots of photons between them. And in the non-relativistic limit, we recover the uh, potential. So um, this is a very fundamental object to think about the scattering amplitude. Um, but there is another motivation. And the other motivation is that the structure of the amplitude, so the structure of A, so I'll usually denote the amplitude by A, but sometimes I'll also denote it by an M, uh, which is sort of motivated by the matrix element. So the structure of the amplitude is constrained by many different things. It's very constrained. It's constrained by locality. It's constrained by unitarity. And uh, one thing that you're going to see a lot uh, during these lectures is that all these constraints allow us to say a lot about the structure of the amplitude. So essentially, this is coming, this is telling us something about the singularities of the amplitude, the poles, the cuts that the amplitude has. And from that, we can, uh, in some cases, completely determine the amplitude. And so you can say, if we can do that, then we have a handle on the observables in a given theory, uh, and that can help us learn about the structure of the theory itself. So these are the two uh, main motivations. Now, this is a very uh, broad field. Uh, and when people talk about amplitudes, they can talk about a number of uh, uh, different things. So let me mention just very, very briefly some of the main uh, areas or, or the main subfields here. So the first one, which I think is historically, at least in recent history, uh, is the, um, has been the starting point for all this. Uh, so the first one is very, very practical, you can say. So it's just the calculation of um, higher order uh, amplitudes in perturbative QCD mainly, and also in the standard model uh, beyond perturbative QCD. And why is this important? It's important, of course, because this is a very hard thing to do. It's not easy to calculate uh, higher order QCD amplitudes. Um, and so if you can get any new handles on that, uh, that that's uh, very important. So, uh, so in this area, um, the, the new tools that, uh, some of the new tools that we'll see here uh, are uh, very important in simplifying the calculations. So you can calculate the amplitudes with uh, using regular Feynman diagrammatic techniques, but then you add in uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, one thing that we'll see is spinner, vari spinner variables, oops, spinner variables, Another thing that we'll see is color ordering. Another thing that we'll see is uh, unitarity and factorization. And what we'll see is that these will let us uh, guess or infer or construct some of the amplitudes from lower point amplitudes. Um, there are other things like soft or collinear limits. Um, and uh, finally, there's uh, supersymmetric chord identities. So all these things allow you to simplify greatly the calculation of uh, higher order um, amplitudes. And so it's been used a lot. It's super important for uh, studying QCD or the standard model in general at the LHC. And the reason is that, of course, for the for anything you do, whether you whether you're interested in the standard model itself or you're interested in 
physics beyond the standard model, you really need to understand standard model processes at uh, very high precision. So practically, this is a very important uh, thing to do. Now, um, right. So, so that's the first area that I want to uh, that I want to I, I want to uh, mention. A second area that I want to mention is uh, something that I alluded to before already, which is just studying the structure of amplitudes for uh, in in its own right. Um, so studying the amplitudes uh, from a theoretical uh, point of view. And um, here we're talking about different uh, different properties of the amplitudes, different symmetries. And you can think about various theories. Uh, in particular, you can think of uh, uh, D equals to, uh, to anything, any number of dimensions, and either no supersymmetry or um, up to N equals four supersymmetry in uh, four dimensions. So people have uh, used this in diverse settings. Um, now, of course, a lot of the formal development has uh, involved a lot of supersymmetry because the more supersymmetry you have, the more constrained you are, uh, and the more tools you have uh, with which to um, constrain the, the structure of both the amplitudes and the theory. So um, a lot of the formal effort has been uh, in that direction. Um, another area which uh, is interesting is the use of amplitudes and the study of the different amplitudes that one can uh, construct in order to learn uh, about um, sort of theory space. What sort of, and what I mean by that is to kind of map the sorts of consistent theories that uh, one can think of by starting with the uh, amplitude. One area where this has been uh, very effective is the area of uh, effective field theories or effective theories. This is something that I'm going to uh, talk about a lot here. Uh, but, th but this is not limited to effective field theories. Um, for example, um, theories, gravitational theories, uh, have been studied studied a lot uh, using amplitudes. Where again, the amplitudes have uh, often let you say a lot about the theory compared to standard sort of Lagrangian uh, approaches. Okay, and we're actually going to see an example of that, which is kind of a very pedestrian example, a very simple example. Uh, throughout the lectures, we're going to see that we can sort of rediscover uh, gauge theories in this way. So um, one thing that we're going to see is that by looking at amplitudes, by requiring that they have uh, consistent properties, we can relearn many of the things that you saw in quantum field theory uh, about uh, gauge theories. So that's going to be our simple example of how you uh, learn about theories from uh, amplitudes. Now, um, essentially, the thing that we're relying on here is uh, what's called a bootstrap. And I'll return to that in a second. So what you mean by the bootstrap is that you uh, learn about amplitudes from amplitudes without referring to Lagrangians. You start from the basic building blocks, the three-point amplitudes, and from those using the different properties of amplitudes, you construct uh, four-point and, and higher-point and higher-order amplitudes. Okay, so um, it, there's, of course, uh, people have looked at uh, both massless and massive amplitudes. Uh, this area is the more mature, and this area, you can say, is maturing. 
And a lot of what I want to emphasize in these lectures is actually these uh, matching theories. Okay, uh, and, and this is again one area where uh, you, you can ask questions about massive theories and try to address them using amplitudes. Uh, for example, uh, what sort of massive gravity theories can you have? Uh, th these questions saw a lot of progress uh, through amplitudes. Um, and one thing that we're going to see here is rediscover some properties of the Higgs mechanism uh, via amplitudes too. Uh, another area where you can see where you can learn about the theory from uh, amplitudes is um, something that goes under the name of the double copy. And the most famous uh, incarnation of that is the fact that if you look at uh, the relation between gravity amplitudes and uh, gauge theory amplitudes, then roughly speaking, the gravity amplitude is equal to the gauge amplitude squared. So for example, you look at an n graviton amplitude and it has the structure of uh, the square of an n uh, gluon amplitude. And that's something that raises the question of what's the deep theory reason of for, for this uh, relation. Um, so that's another example of, you know, trying to learn about theories from uh, amplitudes. Uh, finally, a fourth application or a fourth area that I want to uh, mention, uh, which we're not going to have uh, time to talk about here, is applications to GR. This is something that's growing very fast. It's a very, very active area right now. So as you know, um, there's uh, a lot of stuff that one wants to learn about in spirals, about black hole mergers uh, that are relevant for understanding LIGO uh, data. And to calculate these using traditional methods is very, very uh, hard. Essentially, it's a very uh, it's it's a very heavy problem numerically. Um, and and so amplitude um, methods or on-shell methods have really Pretty amazingly, I think, have, uh, people have shown recently that they can get to the state of the art uh, with what people have done with numerical relativity before uh, and even beyond that, uh, where essentially what you're doing there is you're calculating the classical problem. You're looking at uh, classical scattering, but you're deriving that by starting with uh, amplitudes. So again, this is of uh, practical importance for LIGO and uh, future experiments. Um, and, and it's a very fast moving and interesting field. Okay, so I think even by um, hearing just about these uh, few examples, I think there is a pattern that one can start to see, which is that where are these things very, very useful, where are these methods very powerful? Uh, they're powerful in replacing um, traditional methods for calculating uh, QCD or other gauge theory uh, amplitudes. And also GR, gravi gravity amplitudes. Um, and so it, it kind of tells you already that uh, the place where these uh, methods are efficient are the places where you have a lot of gauge symmetry or uh, gauge redundancy. And that's not very surprising. If you think about it, then what's the problem with uh, gauge theory or gravity? The problem is that we have a Lagrangian. We do everything in a Lagrangian framework. Uh, the Lagrangian is manifestly uh, Lorentz invariant. We want to keep Lorentz symmetry manifest uh, throughout the process. So if we want to describe a spin one particle, the way we describe that is in terms of um, a vector field, right? A vector field that has four uh, 
degrees of freedom or four entries, whereas the physical particle has only two degrees of freedom. Um, so here I'm talking, of course, about massless, uh, massless things. So a photon has two degrees of freedom, but we uh, represent it in terms of a, of a four vector, with, which has uh, four entries. Uh, and so you're carrying a lot of uh, baggage, uh, a lot of gauge redundancy when you're working in terms of the field and not in terms of the particle. So it's not surprising that if you concentrate on the amplitude instead of the Lagrangian, you're just looking at the physical degrees of freedom. And so the problem simplifies considerably. So that's kind of the, the deep reason why these methods are uh, so powerful. Okay, um, so the thing really to emphasize is that when we talk about amplitudes, we're really concentrating on the physical degrees of freedom in the problem. And we're interested in the interactions, we're really thinking about the interactions of uh, physical particles. So that's really the key. Uh, and, and so this turns out to be very powerful anytime you have issues related to uh, gauge redundancy or more generally field redefinitions. If you're working in terms of Lagrangians and fields, uh, in many cases, you know, you can redefine your fields in many different ways as long as your uh, kinetic term is still canonical. And the physics should be the same. So when you work with amplitudes, you never deal with this uh, issue of uh, field redefinitions. You're just really uh, zeroing in on the uh, physical particles. So this is also the reason why, as we'll see, when you talk about uh, effective theories um, where field redefinitions are a big obstacle that you have to overcome right away, uh, these methods are so powerful. Okay. Um, and again, one thing that I already said, one thing that we'll see here is that if this is really all your uh, asking about, in other words, what are the interactions of physical particles, this is going to lead us to rediscover many of the aspects of gauge theories that uh, you are familiar with. Okay. Um, very good. So I think that's roughly uh, what I wanted to say in terms of like the broad uh, picture of the field. Um, okay, so, and and I told you already that when we look at the interactions of uh, massless fields, we'll rediscover many things that you know about gauge theory. You can also ask the question about massive fields. What are we going to discover when we talk about massive fields? So this is going to be um, another thing that I want to uh, highlight in these lectures. And uh, one thing that we can do in this way is to uh, think about the Higgs mechanism. So we're really going to be interested in uh, messy fields and not just messless ones. Um, and, and why is that? So the first reason why we're interested in uh, m not equal to zero is that we're physicists and this is the real world, right? So in the real world, we don't just have photons and gluons, we have uh, Ws and Zs, uh, and we have massive fermions and we have the Higgs, and so we want to understand masses. Uh, so that's the most important reason. Uh, the other reason is that the, one of the fundamental problems that we are dealing with at this point is the origin of mass. So you're 
we already heard about this from Chaba. Chaba is going to um, talk a lot about uh, naturalness. But let me, because it's such a fundamental thing and because it's related to what we're going to talk about, I'm going to uh, steal a little bit of uh, his uh, naturalness story uh, and, and devote some time to, to talk about that. Um, and I think it's okay because it's sufficiently important and, you know, any two people are not going to say exactly the same thing uh, about it. So let me pause uh, a little bit and talk about that. So uh, really the, one of the big questions that we, uh, that we have to answer is the uh, origin of uh, electroweak symmetry breaking. And uh, in these lectures, one of the things that we're going to do is study this by looking at the interactions of massive spin one uh, particles, which correspond to Higgs uh, theories. So, as you know, 10 years ago, the Higgs was discovered, uh, which is something totally amazing. And I think sometimes we're a little, uh, we forget how amazing uh, it is. Because if you think about it, we've never seen anything like the Higgs before. Uh, we've never seen a fundamental spin zero particle. Uh, this particle is the excitations of the Higgs field, which is all around us. Um, and it's the thing that is giving mass to all the fundamental particles. So it's a really rev revolutionary uh, discovery. Um, but from a theory point of view, we're not in a very good um, state, right? Because we have a very, very ad hoc description of, uh, of the Higgs. All we have is a parameterization of electroweak symmetry breaking in terms of a potential. So we write the Higgs potential. Uh, we write it as minus, uh, there is the quadratic term, which is the wrong sign. And and then there is the uh, and then there is the quartic, and there could be some higher dimension interactions, perhaps. But uh, this is what we absolutely need in order to describe the the Higgs mechanism, and it's a very ad hoc description. It's a very effective description. And there are many questions related to that. So one thing we don't know is we don't know why mu squared uh, is positive. In other words, why does the Higgs get a Um Why is electroweak symmetry broken? Uh, we also don't know what sets what sets the scale mu. We don't know why this is about 100 GeV. We don't have any understanding of that. Uh, and finally, we don't know what keeps uh, mu at this, uh, at this scale once we, include, uh, once we include radiative corrections. So what protects it uh, against radiative corrections? Now, in Chava's lectures, you're going to see very concrete uh, and beautiful models that give you exactly that, that generate for you uh, dynamically um, the, the, the mu squared of the, right, uh, <clears throat> of the right sign and lead to uh, symmetry breaking that can give you a scale which is much smaller than the Planck scale. Uh, and that can protect uh, this uh, mass scale against radiative corrections. But at this point, we really, we really don't know any of the answers to this question. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a problem that, uh, that we should think about in, in all, in all, using all the means that we have. Um, 
And and of course, th these are all very, uh, especially the last one of these, what protects the uh, electroweak scale against radiative corrections is a very subtle uh, question. It involves lots of assumptions. It involves an assumption about uh, the, the cutoff of the theory and the fact that there's some new physics and so on and so forth. But but even simpler things like you know why why does it break why does it break the symmetry at all and what's it's the scale are things that we uh, don't understand. So uh, fortunately for us though, we have the LHC, and the LHC is an amazing uh, machine. It's an amazing machine because you have literally millions of measurements that you can make. It's new energies, energies that we've never probed before. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, we have many, many opportunities for learning about new physics if it's there. Uh, and there are different ways of going about it. Uh, we can hope to discover new physics either directly by producing new particles at the LHC or indirectly through their effects on uh, standard model interactions. So in this case, we would uh, we would discover them by essentially calculating EFT amplitudes and uh, comparing that to LHC data. Um, and um, it, it, in either case, the thing that's the, the thing that can be very important here is to uh, try to calculate these amplitudes or calculate the effects of the new particles at the LHC uh, with as little theory um, prejudice as possible because we really don't know what the theory is. Uh, and so it makes sense to approach this problem from a very um, model independent point of view and try to say something about the most general um, scenarios that we could discover at the uh, at the LHC. So part of the thing that we're gonna uh, talk about here is this general parametrization of the most general uh, amplitudes that one can uh, hope to see at the LHC. And I think you're going to have a lot of, um, you're going to hear a lot, a lot about LHC measurements and, uh, if it is in particular, uh, in, in the, in the lectures by Tillman next week. Uh, and, and so you, you'll see the wealth of, uh, opportunities that one has at the LHC. And beyond this, one can hope, you know, given that we have so little theory, knowledge about uh, about the Higgs, really, uh, one can hope that, you know, maybe if we use amplitudes as a starting point, then this perhaps can lead to some new insights on the theory and about the possible new theory behind electroweak symmetry breaking. So uh, these are some of the motivations to look at uh, to look at uh, massive theories. Okay, so before going on to nitty gritty stuff, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the thing that we already referred to, which is uh, what's called the bootstrap. So essentially, what we said is that we can develop many things about amplitudes by uh, starting by just thinking about amplitudes without thinking about uh, Lagrangians. Uh, so I want to talk about this in, in a little more detail. We're going to see this throughout the lectures. Uh, so really here, the idea is that you can construct, construct amplitudes just based on uh, amplitudes alone. And the basic properties of the amplitudes that will enter here are, uh, first of all, the way they transform under 
Lorentz symmetry, and in particular, the little group. So we're going to talk about that. Um, then uh, there's also global symmetries, other global symmetries, if such global symmetries exist. Uh, then there's also factorization and unitarity. So all of these things together um, will allow us to, first of all, determine three-point amplitudes. And then from that, so these are going to be the, the basic building blocks. And then from this, we can determine higher point amplitudes. Oops. Okay. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the plan for the lectures. So this is the plan. So uh, we're first of all going to start with some basics, just to remind you some basics of amplitudes. Uh, then we're going to talk about spinner variables. Um, I'm going to start with m equals zero, and then talk about massive particles. Uh, then we're going to talk about massless amplitudes uh, at tree level, and um, mention all these tools that I described before. Uh, and we're also going to see from this how gauge theories uh, emerge. Uh, and then we're going to loop, move to loop amplitudes and in particular talk about oops, generalized unitarity. Um, then we'll move to uh, massless amplitudes, uh, where we're again, we're, again, we're going to develop the uh, different uh, methods that uh, we'll need, and then we're going to turn to some applications. Okay, so uh, before we start talking about um, really uh, nitty-gritty stuff, uh, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about the origin of uh, bootstrap, because I've I used to wonder about that, uh, and I think I'm probably not the only one. So let me uh, let me talk about that uh, for just a second. So what's uh, what's Bootstrap? If you were wondering about that, so Bootstrap just refers to you know you have a boot, and when you try to put on a boot, it's very hard. So there is often a little strap or a little loop that's uh, at the back of the boot, and you pull that, and it helps you put the boot on. So this is the this is what the word refers to. And uh, this is from Wikipedia. So the saying, this is coming from, so the, the term bootstrap is coming from the saying uh, to pull yourself, to put, put, pull oneself up by one's bootstraps. Uh, so essentially the idea is that you uh, just lift yourself up without any outside, without any external help. Uh, so in this case, you're just calculating amplitudes from amplitudes alone without any uh, reference to anything else. And this was used as a metaphor, uh, meaning how to better oneself uh, already in 1922. Now, if you read like me, uh, the surprising adventures of uh, Baron Munchausen, uh, which, you know, if you, if you didn't, then I highly recommend it. I think I read this uh, many, many, many times uh, as a kid. So this is the, this is the picture. Here is uh, the Baron. He fell into the swamp and he's pulling himself up by his hair and uh, just uh, getting out of the swamp in this way. So that's, I guess, the European uh, equivalent of the, uh, of the American uh, phrase. What I didn't tell you is the rest of the, what I didn't show you before is the rest of the uh, story from Wikipedia, which is that uh, the saying was uh, uh, 
was kind of a sardonic saying because it referred to it's an example of an impossible task. Uh, and this is another example where it says it is conjectured that Mr. Murphy will now be enabled to hand himself over the Cumberland River or bar a, or bar, or a barnyard fence by the straps of uh, his boots. Uh, um, Yael, so, Yael, uh, sorry that I interrupt. Yeah. Um, I think we're just seeing your camera, but not what you are writing on the iPad. Oh, 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 sorry. I, it's of course I very nice so, to yeah. see you larger on the screen, but now we have the feeling that you are writing. Wait, let's see. Um, can you see that now? No. Oh, okay. What about now? Now, yes. Okay, so did you see this before or not? Uh, no, we didn't. Ah, okay, sorry. So this is the, so let me show you again. So this is the, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, so the saying is that you pull yourself up by one's bootstraps. And this is the uh, children's book uh, illustration of, uh, this is the Baron Milhausen, and he's pulling himself up by his hair and rescuing, rescuing himself out of the swamp. So, um, so that's the, and, and then the, the last one was just uh, completing the Wikipedia story, which you can, uh, which you can see for yourself. So it was, uh, it, it had a pretty negative, ironic meaning, an example of an impossible task. Uh, hopefully here, uh, this is not going to be the case. Okay, so now let me share screen again. Okay, and go back here. So you can see my uh, notepad, right? Okay, very good. So I just told you very general stuff, but if there are any questions, then um, I'm happy to uh, to take them. Any questions? Yes. Wait. I'll come to you. So uh, right now you were focusing mostly on the gauge theories, and you were saying how the gauge redundancy can be avoided uh, with bootstrap. Uh, but I was wondering if you have something like Rarita Schwinger, where you have a redundancy from the Lorentz representation. Uh, can you do something similar? If you have something like what? If you uh, have something like uh, Rarita Schwinger or like spin three half, spin two, whatever, and you have a redundancy in the Lorentz representation instead of the gauge uh, representation. Right. So when I... Right, so a lot of what I said about the gauge theories also refers to gravity. Um, and there, there is a lot of stuff. There's a, a huge literature on massive gravity theories uh, using amplitudes. So I don't know, I mean, personally, I don't know anything specifically about Rita Schwinger, but higher spins were certainly um, studied using uh, amplitudes. Um, you know, whether it's uh, essentially um, different theories involving higher spins and interactions with uh, gravitons. Okay, thank you. Any other question now? No? Yes, please. Um, I'm just curious. Um, with amplitude methods, are we able to see uh, properties of the dynamics? For example, uh, in the Higgs sector, um, the order of the transition and so on? Um, no, not in any, not in anything that I'm aware of. Um, um, but, um, yeah, so we're not going to see any example of that type. Um, I don't think I'm aware of anything that was done along these lines, no. Mm, 
more questions? No, then we can continue with the lecture. And if okay. there are hands, we will let you know, Yael. OK, thank you. Good. OK, so uh, now, let's, um, now let's get to business. So uh, let me first of all talk about my conventions, which is very important. Uh, so my conventions here, um, first of all, the metric, I'm going to uh, work with the West Coast metric, which is, of course, the right metric to use. Um, same as uh, Piskin and Schroeder. Many of my conventions are going to be the same as uh, Piskin and Schroeder. So, for example, one thing that we'll need a lot is the uh, vector of uh, Pauli matrices. So my sigma mu is going to be 1 and sigma, and my sigma bar mu is going to be 1 uh, minus sigma. Uh, and gamma mu is going to be uh, this off-diagonal uh, block matrix. And, and these are the, the main things uh, I'm going to use. Now, I didn't, I didn't cite this in the literature list that I gave you, but uh, you can see a lot of my conventions and a lot of the spinner stuff that I'm going to be uh, telling you about in these two papers, uh, there's Shadmi Weiss, uh, 1809 09644, and Durye and Kitahara, and Shadmi and Weiss from 1909. Um, and Throughout, I'm going to use really the conventions uh, in here. There's some differences in spinner conventions between this first paper and second. Uh, so this is where you'll be able to see uh, pretty much everything that I'm going to use here. OK, so let me uh, start with the basics. Um, so a scattering process, in a scattering process, we in general, we have m particles going into n particles. Usually, we have two particles in the initial state, and we're going to take n minus two particles in the final state. So altogether, we have an endpoint amplitude. Um, and a scattering process is described by the S matrix, S equals 1 plus it. The one just says that there's no scattering, nothing happened. The initial state uh, equals the final state. Uh, and T is the transition, uh, transition matrix. Uh, and the amplitude is the matrix element of T. So this is our operator. The uh, amplitude is just the matrix element of this T here. Um, concretely, if we have a final state with P1 to Pf momenta, then It between this and uh, P1, P2 uh, is equal, or let me change notation to K1, K2 here. This is equal to 2 pi to the fourth delta 4 of some p i minus k1 minus k2 um, times i a of k1 k2 to the set of momenta p f. And very often I'll denote that also by m instead of a. Okay. Uh, from A, we calculate the cross-section. From the amplitude, we calculate the cross-section. So uh, the sigma is equal to uh, 2 E1, E2, V1 minus V2, where these are the initial state uh, velocities, times the phase space integral over all the final state momenta over 2 uh, pi cubed. 1 over 2 EF times the amplitude squared times another 
delta function for momentum conservation. One thing that we'll use a lot is the fact that S, this, the uh, S matrix is unitary. So S dagger S equals one. Uh, this gives us the optical theorem. The fact that uh, if we use the fact that S equals one plus I T, then the imaginary part of T is equal to one half T dagger T. So this is going to come up a lot uh, in what we do. And in terms of the amplitude, it means that the imaginary part of A is related to the square of the amplitude. OK, uh, now in your QFT classes, you learned how to calculate uh, the amplitude. You know that the starting point for that is the correlator. So if you're interested in calculating uh, some endpoint particle, the thing that you start from is the uh, correlator where you have, let's say for a scalar theory, let's talk about a scalar theory first. Uh, so we have the time ordered product to phi x1 to phi xn. Uh, and omega is the ground state of our interacting theory. So this is the thing that we know how to calculate. Um, and when we're interested in the uh, scattering amplitude, the thing that we want to do is we want to look for the multi-particle multi pole uh, in, this, uh, in this correlator. And essentially, for any one of the external particle, look for uh, the pole corresponding to that. Uh, and then the residue of that is related to the amplitude. So essentially, this thing in momentum space uh, has a term which goes like p squared minus m squared um, for each one of the uh, external particles. Um, times, there is also a factor of the wave function renormalization, a square root of that. And up to this wave function renormalizations, the um, residue of uh, this multi-particle pole is the amplitude of interest. So this is the uh, amplitude that we're interested in. OK, and so in terms of Feynman diagrams, what this corresponds to, of course, is the amputated uh, it, it's in order to calculate that we're interested in the amputated uh, Feynman diagrams, uh, which we need to sum. Now, um, this function is an analytic function of the momenta. Uh, that's something that we're going to, again, turn to a lot. So it's an analytic function of uh, the PIs. And when we talk about uh, an analytic function, you already know that we're going to talk about complex momenta. So in a lot of this, we're going to take the momenta to be uh, completely complex. And this shouldn't be too shocking or surprising because we, you're really used to that. I mean, as soon as we talk about propagators, we write down uh, the propagator with the I epsilon prescription here. We have continued our momenta to the complex plane. And so um, it, it's not a big, um, it, it's not too revolutionary to say that we're going to uh, consider complex momenta um, when we talk about amplitudes. Now, so far, I just talked about uh, scalar amplitudes, but let's talk uh, some more about uh, non zero spin. So for non-zero spin, uh, there is something else which we need to do because we now need to specify the spin information. And essentially, in order to describe a particle, I really need to give you two directions. I need to give you the direction of its momentum. So that's the direction p hat. But I also need to give you the spin axis. So I need to tell you what's the direction along which I'm going to quantize the spin. Um, 
And then my states are going to be states that uh, are characterized by the direction of the momentum and also the different polarizations uh, along the spin direction that we chose. Now, when we calculate amplitudes, we need, of course, to uh, include polarizations uh, in order to take us from the fields to the physical states. And so uh, the, the main things or, that we're going to talk about here are spin one half fermions and spin one vectors. Um, and so I'm sure you've all seen this, but let me say this just so we're on the same page. So these polarizations, uh, whether for fermions or for vectors, carry the spin information uh, about the particle. And for fermions, if I have some amplitude with an external fermion leg of momentum P, then you know that uh, if I have a fermion, then it, if it's uh, incoming, I should include some uh, spinner USP. This is if it's incoming. Uh, if it's outgoing, I should include U bar S of P. This is for outgoing. Uh, and similarly for anti-fermions, we have V SP for outgoing and V bar SP for incoming. Uh, similarly for vectors, we also need to include polarizations. Uh, for a vector of momentum P, we need to include some polarization vector epsilon I of P, where uh, if we're talking about massless particles, uh, we have two uh, polarization states. Sorry, uh, this I equals one or two. And for massive ones, we have three polarizations. Okay, now let's talk about each one of these uh, in turn, because we're going to introduce some uh, um, new variables to describe them. So uh, first of all, let's look about, let's, let's talk about fermion polarizations. Specifically, let me just look at U of P. So this solves the Dirac equation, P slash, P slash minus M U P equals zero. Uh, we have two uh, different solutions for that, which just corresponds to the two spin states or the two uh, projections along the spin direction. Um, and so we can write them, for example, in this way is the square root of p dot sigma times some xi of s and p dot sigma bar uh, xi of s, where this xi is some arbitrary two-component vector or spinner. So because this is a two-component object, there are, of course, it's spanned by two uh, independent uh, by two independent vectors, and and we have uh, two possible solutions for s equals one and two. Uh, for example, if we choose for c s one zero and zero one. Then, if our spin is, if our momentum is along the z direction, then we get uh, the two helicity states with uh, plus or minus helicity, where the uh, spin is quantized along the uh, direction of motion. Okay, so in this case, things simplify a lot. In this case, our u of p is just equal to uh, the square root of e minus p times one, zero, and E plus P times one, zero. Uh, and similarly, this is for S 
equals plus a half and similarly for uh, the other state. And if we have m equals zero, then of course these reduce uh, to either upper or lower uh, spinners. We just have two e square root of two e times uh, zero one zero or the uh, other way around. Okay, um, for vector polarizations, uh, the thing, so let's talk about vector polarizations, uh, which will denote by epsilon of k. So here we want these to satisfy uh, that k dot epsilon is zero. Uh, and there's also a normalization that we need uh, so usually we choose epsilon dot epsilon star to be equal to minus one. And let's first of all talk about massless particles. So for massless particles, let's say our k mu is e times one, zero, zero, one. Uh, so we have a momentum in the z direction, then uh, epsilon mu uh, with this uh, direction of motion, uh, and let me also add plus or minus here, epsilon plus or minus of z uh, equals one over square root of two, zero minus plus one and minus i zero. Uh, and similarly for any other direction, if you if we want to get the polarization vector in another direction, we just uh, boost to any different, we, we just rotate to any different direction. Um, and this is actually something that's not, um, th th that, that is not unique because we can take epsilon mu of k and shift it to epsilon mu of k plus some number times k mu and nothing's gonna change. Nothing's gonna change because it's still going to satisfy that k dot epsilon is zero. It's still, it's still going to satisfy the normalization condition. Uh, and it's simply a reflection of uh, gauge symmetry. So gauge symmetry tells us that our amplitude satisfy the word identity. If we take the uh, polarization vector and replace it by kmu, um, the amplitude would vanish. So this shift does not make any difference. Okay, now um, if we talk about a massive spin one now, instead of a massless spin one, then those two polarizations uh, are still good, uh, still give a good description of the transverse polarizations of the um, massive particle. But in addition, we also have a longitudinal polarization, epsilon mu uh, zero of k, which is uh, equal to k over m zero zero e over m. And again, if we're interested in some arbitrary direction, we can uh, simply do a Lorentz transformation to um, go to a different direction. So this is, again, this is for uh, a momentum along the z direction. So in this case, our k mu is equal to e zero zero k. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so this is what I wanted to remind you about uh, uh, polarization vectors. And let's also uh, talk a little bit about the Lorentz group. Um, so again, this is something that you probably saw before, but um, it's important to uh, be on the same page. So if you remember, 
the Lorentz group is SO3, comma 1. And it can actually be reduced. It actually reduces to two SU2s. You can think of it as a product of two SU2s that we're going to label by SU2 left times SU2 right. And if you don't remember this, then this is a very important uh, exercise. It's actually a problem. It's a problem in Peskin. So it's problem 3.1 in uh, Peskin and Schroeder. So if you don't remember this, just do this exercise. Um, so the point is that if you look at the Lorentz algebra, the Lorentz algebra is given by J mu nu J rho sigma. Uh, this commutator is given by I G nu rho J mu sigma. Uh, minus permutations, my plus or minus permutations that I'm not, not going to write down. And then we can define two objects. We can define Li, which are one half, epsilon ijk, um, jk, which are their rotations, and Ai, which is j0i, which are the boosts. Uh, and under some infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, lambda, uh, we have that lambda can be written as 1 minus i theta dot L minus i beta dot, uh, beta dot K. Uh, so this is the rotations and boosts of Lorentz. But then we can form out of these J pluses which are one half L plus IK and a J minus, which is the same with the minus. Uh, and these guys actually to form the two uh, separate SU2s, SU2 left and SU2 right. So if, again, if this is something that you don't remember, then uh, you can just go through this exercise. And then we can organize all the Lorentz, all the different re Lorentz representations in terms of representations of this uh, S times SU2 right. Can you hear me okay? Because I get a little bit of... Oh. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, good. Okay, so the basic uh, SU2 representations are the spinner representations. So we have the one half zero uh, of this, uh, namely a doublet of this SU two L and a singlet of the SU two right, and similarly a zero one half, uh, which are conjugate representations. And under these, we can form all the representations of Lorentz. So these two representations are going to be the basic building blocks. And out of these, we can uh, construct any representation of Lorentz. Okay. And in particular, if we think about uh, um, if we think about uh, spin one half representations, namely, uh, let's talk about a Dirac spinner. So the uh, Dirac spinner psi x is something that we can write as psi lx and psi rx, where each one of these is a two component spinner. And under the under a Lorentz transformation, this psi l uh, transforms as one minus i uh, theta plus beta. Uh, dot sigma over to psi L and psi R um, is almost the same, but there is a minus sign here instead of a plus. So these transform under uh, different representations of Lorentz. And we can also write this guy as one minus I alpha L dot J L psi L and this guy is one minus alpha right 
dot j r psi r. So we can see um, explicitly how these two uh, transform under different Lorentz transformations with uh, parameters alpha l and alpha r. Okay, now let's go back to talk about the polarizations that we started talking about before. Um, but before that, there is uh, another um, another thing that we need to discuss, which is a little bit of notation. So let's talk about some notation for two component spinners. So I have to say we're spending we're doing things very, very slowly, and we're spending a lot of time on this because I think that a lot of the time the barrier to uh, in in this story is the notation. Uh, if you if you're not used to that, the notation can be a little hard to get used to. So um, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time and uh, getting used to it uh, gradually. So this is what we're doing. Um, so usually what we're going to do is we're going to denote uh, uh, left-handed spinners uh, using an index alpha. So for this SU2L, the our index is going to be denoted by alpha, and for SU2R, we're going to denote its index by alpha dot. So we uh, have dotted spinners and undotted spinners. So here we're going to have spinners lambda alpha, uh, and here we're going to have spinners lambda tilde alpha dot. Um, and so there's some uh, superfluous notation here that the undotted spinners are lambdas, the dotted spinners have a tilde on them, and there's even more superfluous notation that we're going to introduce which is that sometimes and many times we're going to label uh, these spinners by uh, um, a kit like this with, um, with an angle here, and these guys by a bracket like this. Um, and let me also put a lambda tilde here. Okay. Uh, and... Not only that, but very often you'll see people, different people use different notations and different people switch notations uh, all the time. So you, you really have to get used to all these different ways of writing the spinners. Uh, but there's really nothing very deep in this. Now we can raise and lower indices uh, and contract uh, spinners using the SU2 invariant tensor, epsilon, uh, alpha beta or epsilon uh, alpha dot beta dot. So this is the anti-symmetric uh, tensor. And my convention is going to be that for any uh, set of indices, epsilon ij is equal to minus epsilon ij and epsilon 1, 2 equals 1. And so the way we contract uh, these angle spinners Lambda uh, chi is defined as follows. It's epsilon alpha beta, uh, lambda alpha chi beta, uh, or which we can also write as lambda alpha chi alpha, uh, and this is equal to minus chi lambda. And for the um, dotted spinners or tilted spinners, uh, we have epsilon alpha dot beta dot, uh, lambda tilde alpha dot, uh, chi tilde beta dot, which is lambda tilde alpha dot, chi alpha dot, which is equal to minus chi lambda. Okay, so uh, here we um, contract spinners like this. And here we contract spinners like this. That's the thing that you should try to uh, remember. Okay. Okay, now 
Um, when we're interested in scattering amplitudes, our amplitude uh, depends on a bunch of things. It's a function, of course, of the couplings. Uh, and it's a function, of course, of the momenta. And it's a function of the polarizations. If we have uh, particles with non-zero spins. And as with anything of any importance, there are, of course, many different ways to represent it. So, you know, usually you're used to uh, representing it in terms of uh, simply momenta and polarizations, that is, u's, epsilons, and so on and so forth. Um, here we're going to write everything in terms of two component spinners, exactly the ones I introduced just now. And there are other ways to write the amplitudes. There are, for example, things called twisters and momentum twisters. Um, and each one of these uh, ways of writing things of, or writing the amplitude uh, makes different things simpler or more manifest. But uh, as we'll see, uh, this is going to be very useful. And, and this is the thing that we'll use here. So this is why we're spending some time uh, talking about uh, spinners. OK, so going back now to our polarizations, uh, we want to write these guys in terms of uh, massless spinners. So let's first of all talk about the polarizations of spin one half uh, fermions. Uh, and let's first of all start by talking about Messless ones. So here our spinners are simply either lambdas. Uh, so this is my four component Dirac spinner, and it splits into an upper um, spinner like this. Uh, and sometimes, as I said, I'm going to represent this guy uh, in terms of a, of a kit like this, and it's usually labeled as P. And Sometimes if we're talking about particle I, if this is particle I in the uh, scattering amplitude, so it has momentum PI, we're going to label this guy simply by I like this. And um, we also have uh, the right-handed spinners with lower component um, pieces uh, like this that we're going to label also like this or like this. So in this case, we trivially write the massless spinners as massless spinners. It's very simple. Then another thing that we need is we need momenta. That's, of course, uh, any amplitude will depend on that. So momenta are four vectors. And we can write them in the one half, one half representation uh, using the one half zero and zero one half uh, representations that we uh, talked about before. And to see this, uh, it's easy to just uh, replace P by P mu gamma mu. So then we have a matrix that we can write in block form like this. We have P mu, sigma mu, um, alpha, alpha dot here, and P mu, sigma bar mu, uh, alpha dot alpha here, and this is zero. Um, and we can calculate the uh, determinant of that, let's let's first of all, um, or actually before we do that, let me also write it uh, explicitly. So let's write, for example, this block, P mu sigma mu. <clears throat> this guy is equal to P0 plus P3, uh, P1 minus IP2, P1 plus IP2, P0 minus P3. And so if your mass is zero, if you have zero mass and you calculate this determinant, 
then the determinant of this P mu sigma mu uh, is zero. Um, we can write this thing as, or this thing here is P alpha alpha dot. These are the three indices on that. So for a massless momentum, if we have M equals zero, the determinant of P alpha alpha dot is zero. And therefore we can write it in terms of two, uh, two component spinners. So we can write P alpha alpha dot is the direct product of um, some lambda alpha and lambda tilde alpha dot, which we can also denote as P P. Um, okay. Concretely, if we, it's it's sometimes useful to see an explicit uh, representation for these guys. So uh, concretely, it's just given by lambda alpha of p. I can write as some c divided by p zero minus p three times p zero minus three minus p one minus i p two and lambda alpha dot p is equal to c to the minus one over the same normalization. Uh, and here we have p0 minus p3 minus p1 plus ip2. And if we're talking about real momenta, then c is just a phase. So this c is some e to the i phi. Um, and if we're talking about complex momenta, it can be some complex number. Okay. Um, any questions about this so far? Okay. I guess it's a lot of notations, but uh, we have to uh, we have to go through them. Okay. So if there are no more questions, if there are no questions, then let's. Uh, talk about vector polarizations. So again, I'm talking about massless stuff at this point. So I have a particle with some momentum k mu, uh, which we can take to be in the z direction. And we wrote down the uh, polarizations before. So we had epsilon mu uh, plus or minus, which was uh, given by this thing. And now I want to write this guy in terms of uh, um, these uh, massless spinners. So in order to do that, and in order to write it in some Lorentz covariant form, first of all, uh, it's useful to introduce some k tilde, which is the vector k zero, zero minus k. And then uh, the way we can write our uh, vector epsilon, epsilon mu, which we had over here, we can just write it as minus one over square root of two, k sigma mu k tilde divided by k k tilde. So um, it would be a good idea to try to calculate this. So you can just take this as an exercise and convince yourself that this is indeed uh, what you get. But actually, um, I told you before that uh, this polarization vector it is defined really up to a shift by k mu. We don't care about su such uh, shifts. So actually what we can do is we can replace this k tilde here. We can replace the spinner k tilde by any spinner R, any two component spinner R, um, which is completely arbitrary. And you can convince yourself that if you replace K tilde by R, um, the only effect of this thing is to shift epsilon mu by something proportional to uh, K mu. So um, this thing is going to be a good enough uh, polarization vector with any choice 
of a, a reference spinner here. And so indeed we can write our uh, polarizations and this is what we're gonna do is we're gonna have epsilon alpha alpha dot uh, plus of K. We can write it as square root of two times R K divided by KR and similarly epsilon minus uh, alpha alpha dot is going to be square root of two times k r divided by k r. And r is completely arbitrary. Of course, the only thing we need from r is we need this spinner product. Oops, sorry, that's not what I meant. We want this spinner product and this spinner product to be non-zero. So if you think about it, uh, it's not terribly surprising. Uh, our polarization vector depends on some arbitrary spinner R, but uh, this is just uh, a sign of uh, gauge invariance. This is just a con consequence of gauge invariance. Uh, so we can write uh, epsilon in this way. And the fact that we have this arbitrary spinner appear means that when we calculate amplitudes, if we make a smart choice of this R here, uh, we can simplify some of our uh, calculations. Okay, so at this point, what we have is uh, an amplitude that, as we said, depends on couplings, momenta, and polarizations. And at this point, we're just, uh, we, we only talked about m equals zero particles, but in this case, we saw that both the momenta and the polarizations, we can write in terms of these uh, messless spinners, p and uh, p angle and p uh, square. So everything, all the, um, the entire amplitude is gonna be given in terms of uh, spinner products. So it's going to be, it's going to involve things of the sort ij or ij uh, in addition to the uh, Mandelstam invariance sij, which are pi plus pj squared. And this is very nice because it means that all our amplitudes, um, independently of the particle content, um, are going to be written in the same form. And it has other advantages that are even uh, more profound, but uh, that's something that we'll see uh, later. So, okay, I think I finished all the notations for the uh, messless amplitudes. So the next thing I wanna do is talk about massive amplitudes, but probably this is a good time, I'm not sure if I have any time left, I'm not sure exactly what time I started, so. In principle, um, I think the time is about up now, but we could ask for questions maybe at this point, if that is okay with you, Yael? Mm -hmm. Okay. So are there any, are there any more questions? It's a lot of notation, of course. I think in the in the exercise class tomorrow afternoon, maybe we go over some of this material again. Any questions, complaints, ideas? Yes, please. Professor Ayal, can you please, Professor, Ar Professor Ayal, please can can you repeat the expl the explanation or the idea of the notation, not the bra, or but the other um, notation, the right line and the square parentheses? Can you repeat, please, to explain the the, the notation? the idea of Ket and the other for the spinners, please? 
Sorry, I couldn't... Um, I think the question was, uh, Yael, uh, uh, to explain again the difference between the cat spinners and the rectangular bracket spinners. Yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so let me... So, okay, so the two sorts of spinners, they're both two-component spinners. Both of them, so you know that uh, when we talk about SU2, the fundamental representation of SU2 is um, the two-dimensional representation or the doublet representation. Uh, and the fundamental objects there are two-component things, right? You can think of them as two-component vectors or uh, two states. Um, and when we talk about uh, fermions, we usually talk about spinners. So both of these spinners are two component spinners. They are doublets of an SU, they are SU2 doublets, but uh, we have two SU2s in the Lorentz group. So the Lorentz group splits into uh, two SU2s. There's this um, SU2 left times SU2 right. And I think that this is, if this is confusing to you, then this exercise is a really good exercise. So you take the generators of the Lorentz algebra. This is the Lorentz algebra here. And you can show that they split into two sets of generators. The J pluses, which are uh, these guys here with a plus between, uh, with the, oops, I don't know why this is doing this. So we have the J pluses. Oh. I'm not happy about this. Let me try. Um, I don't know what happened to my pen. So we have the J pluses. <laughs> this is very bad news. That are, um, that go like L plus IK. And we have the uh, J minuses, which are the same thing with the minus here. And these two sets form two different SU2s. So the J pluses commute with all the J minuses and uh, each set on its own um, forms an SU2. They, they both satisfy the uh, SU2 algebra. So our algebra splits into an SU2 left times SU2 right or two SU2s that we call SU2 left and SU2 right. And the two different spinners are just uh, the doublet representations of uh, the SU2 left and the SU2 right. So um, this guy here, um, psi left. Um, so first of all, you see, we can write our Dirac spinners is in this form where we um, divided them into an upper spinner and a lower spinner. And the upper spinner, Psi L, transforms under the action of the uh, JLs, and the Psi R transforms under the action of the JRs. So one type of spinners, so both are two component spinners, one transforms under the uh, SU2 left and the other one under the SU2 right. Okay, now in the messless case, they split completely. Each one of these, um, some, sometimes we talk about, we refer to this as chirality. Uh, th these have left chirality, the Psi Ls have left chirality or positive chirality and the Psi Rs have uh, negative chirality. In the massless case, these two spinners don't talk to each other. The, they're completely decoupled, the left and the right. Uh, and if you look at the Dirac equation in the massive case, which we're going to do next time, the mass term couples them. Uh, in the massless case, uh, one of them corresponds to positive helicity, the other one corresponds to negative helicity, and helicity is a good uh, quantum number. So that's the physical meaning of these two uh, spinners. Okay. I don't know if that answers the question no, no, it, or you have... Uh, it, it did, I think, for now, yeah. 
Okay, I don't see, I see a lot of exhausted students. I don't see more questions. So let's uh, thank Yael again for this beautiful lecture. And we have lunch break now until 3.15, right? 3.15 is the cosmology lecture. And do you want to say something okay. practical where, where the, it's in the, in the uh, yeah, you have information, a, a, right? 